Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be here today. We're thankful to have opportunity and freedom to worship you. We pray, Lord, that you'll give us not just an intellectual experience today, but a practical one with you. Let your Holy Spirit be here to speak to our heart and our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. You can open your Bible to Matthew 24. We're going to look at the biblical call to readiness today. And during the sermon, we're going to look at the biblical reason why we should be ready for what's coming. And this afternoon at 1.30, I'm going to give you some practical tips on how to be ready. So it's going to be not a sermon this afternoon, but like show and tell. I brought tons of stuff to show you some very practical ways that you can prepare for what's coming. So this is a picture of the Wind River Ranges in Wyoming. And if you look really carefully, you can see our tent right there in the corner. And Bob and I love to go every year out into the wilderness on backpacking trips. And we do not just say, I'm going to wear my Sabbath clothes and I'm going to go off into the wilderness and I'm going to have faith in God. Right? What goes into that kind of trip? In order to do that kind of trip, you have to plan and you have to prepare and you have to fill your backpack with everything that you need to survive in that kind of environment. So what I'm telling you today is that the Bible is giving us a practical call to readiness. Does that mean that we don't have faith in God? No, it doesn't. It means that we have faith in God, but our faith in God works in us to get us ready for what's coming. Does that make sense? We can't just sit in our pew and say, I have faith in God. Uh, my employer is just going to send me a check even though I don't go to work. It doesn't work that way, does it? So the Bible says that in the last days, perilous times will come. Look what it says in Timothy. In the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. There's a certain climate in the last days that makes it challenging. It's challenging mentally. It's challenging spiritually. It's challenging physically. And God is trying to equip us. I'm not really sure this is working. Oh, he's trying to equip us because it goes on in that chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, you must continue in the things which you have learned. So God expects us to be continuers. When difficult times come in the last days, God, God's intention is not that we be quitters. God's intention is that we be continuers, right? So he's trying to equip us, just like Bob and I equip ourselves to go out into the wilderness. God is trying to equip us in every possible way to be survivors in the last day. In fact, it says in Matthew 24, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's talking about survivors, right? God expects that when Jesus comes, there will be survivors. Don't you want to be one of those survivors? Wouldn't it be cool? But in order to be one of those survivors, we have to be ready for what's coming in the world. And so God gave us Matthew chapter 24. I would challenge you to read Matthew 24 again, but from a different perspective. If all God intended us to do was to have faith in Jesus, Matthew 24 would have one verse. It would say, the end of the world is going to be worse than you ever thought. Have faith in Jesus, period. Right? It, it doesn't say that. It says, the end of the world is coming. All these scenarios are going to happen. 
I'm telling you before they happen so that you can prepare for these scenarios so that when they happen, you are better equipped to deal with the scenario. That's why God is telling us. Chapter 24 of Matthew is Jesus' prepper manual. I'm not talking about doomsday prepper. There's a certain, there's TV shows, there are certain groups of people in the world that are doomsday preppers. And a doomsday prepper says, I'm going to survive and I'm going to kill you if I have to, to do it. I'm not talking about doomsday preppers. I'm talking about people who are prepared for what's coming because if you're prepared, you're prepared to help others. Like when COVID started, so I've been, I've had this mentality ever since before I was an, even a Christian because I grew up in kind of a harsh environment. Winter storms would come and we would be snowed in for weeks at a time. And it was no big deal, you know why? We were ready for it, we were prepared for it. When COVID hit and when COVID first hit and you had to wear a mask, our neighbors were out in the yard and they're like, we're starving over here. Like we can't get any food. And it was a young couple, we can't get any food and we don't have any masks and you can't buy any masks. And they, were, they felt trapped. And I said, I have masks, hold on. I just went in, got some masks, gave them masks. I ended up mailing masks to people. You know why I had masks to mail? Because I was prepared for something. And I'm telling you today, if you will prepare for what is coming, and if you're prepared for one thing, you're generally going to be more prepared for everything. Does that make sense? When, when the pandemic hit and you couldn't go out, maybe you were afraid to go buy groceries, you couldn't order groceries, the shelves were bare. Did you have food? Did you have masks? Did you have water? Did you have what you needed? There are lots of people who didn't have what they needed. So the Bible is full of these scenarios, floods, violent tornadoes, derechos, solar flares, earthquakes, landslides, hail. Did you see that just this week there was a hail, a river of hail that was pushing cars and stuff down streets? This week, thousands of cows died in Kansas from heat stroke. Did you see that? It was just yesterday. Thousands of cows in Kansas died from heat stroke. This is a weird time to be alive. My sister told me the other day, every time you hear something on the news, it's the worst of that thing that's ever happened. It's the worst forest fire that ever happened. It's the worst flooding that ever happened at Yellowstone. It's the worst famine. It's the worst drought. It's hotter in Europe than it's ever been. It's always the worst. You know why? Matthew 24, that's why. We're living in the last days. This is the beginning of sorrows. But we're not alone in this. Jesus knew this was coming. Jesus wants to walk with us. Jesus wants to prepare us because the more prepared you are, the less scared you are. And so he's wanting to prepare us for these disasters and these things that are coming. There's a call in the Bible to readiness. There's a call to readiness. Get ready, get ready, get ready. If you read any of our books, the, the call is a call to readiness. Get ready, get ready, get ready. What is, going, what is coming is going to overtake the world like an overwhelming surprise. There's a verse in the Bible that says, Earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Be ready. Jesus even says in Matthew 24, watch and pray. Be ready, be ready, be ready. So there's this real definite need that we are ready for these scenarios that are happening at the end of the world. The end of the world as we know it. In some ways, COVID has already changed the world as we know it. We're not going back to where we were. The world has taken a turn in Matthew chapter 24. 
and we're not going backwards, we're going forwards. The time to prepare for the next thing that's coming is right now. And I'm telling you this in a very practical way. Several months ago, you could not even buy N95 masks. Right now, you can buy N95 masks. The time for, to prepare for a crisis is not in the crisis. You can't prepare in the crisis. You have to prepare before the crisis. Now, I'm not t telling you to freak out and you know be scared or anything. I'm telling you, be prepared, and then you won't be scared. Be ready, and if you get ready, you will be ready for what's coming. We need to understand the potential of what could happen. So I'm just going to go through quickly through a few things. Currently, there are this many armed conflicts going on in the world. This many countries are in man-to-man -man weapon conflict in the world. And you hear a lot about Ukraine, but you don't hear so much about the armed conflict that's going on in these other countries. Jesus said, prepare for war. How do you prepare for war? What should you do to prepare for war? What should you have in place to prepare for war? Are you prepared for war? What do you even do to prepare for war? This is why we're going to talk about these practical things this afternoon. The prediction is in 2022 that we will have conflict in this many places, in this year. In this year, the prediction. What Jesus said in Matthew 22, I believe, is absolute truth. And I believe we're seeing it happening in our day. And I'm not telling you these things to scare you. I'm telling you these things so that you will be prepared for what's coming. Every time I do one of these seminars, I have to scratch out the numbers of refugees in the world. Now there are 82 million refugees in the world. 82 million refugees. Can you imagine? Just the refugees coming out of Ukraine right now is astounding. In fact, I have a friend who just got back from Ukraine. And this is what I believe in my heart. I believe not only should I be personally prepared, not only should my family be prepared, but I believe we should be prepared as a church to help when there's crises. And I believe there's a biblical call that as a church that we be prepared for helping other people in a crisis. We are Christians after all, right? We are a church that believes Jesus is coming and the end of the world is coming. So of all the people in the world, we should be the most prepared to help others. The churches in Ukraine have turned all their churches and schools. These are real pictures from my friend who was just there. They're places of refugee where people are coming. They're living in the schools. They're living in the church. They're being fed with food in the church. There's water in the church. What would be wrong with us preparing our church to be a place like that where we could, in a crisis, in a derecho, people could come here and sleep on the floor and have food and water. In a tornado, people could come here. In civil unrest or a civil war, people could come here and have food. What would be wrong with being that prepared? I was backpacking one time and we came out of the wilderness on a Saturday morning and we were driving and my friends and I saw this little Adventist church. We were grubby, we'd been out in the wilderness for a week, you know, our hair, we looked like squirrels and, you know, we stunk and we were dirty and everything. And we stopped at this little Adventist church and we had a dog and we sat in the back with our dog on the pew and after church, these people are like, we, we're prepared for you. I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, we have a sack lunch for you. You can stay for potluck, but if you can't stay for potluck, we have a sack lunch sit for you. We have dog food for your dog. Here's some bottles of water. I'm like, dude, this is awesome, right? I mean, so awesome to have a church prepared. They were right there on the the edge of the trailhead for the Pacific Crest Trail. What a brilliant thing for them to do, to be prepared for these weary hikers that might venture into their church. 
we can be prepared. We can be prepared to help. The prediction is that global hunger will be at an all-time crisis. There's also a prediction right now that in 2022 and onward, that there could be global food shortages like we've never seen before. Again, worse than ever before, right? And not, not just in some third world country. In fact, I just read a thing this morning that on my phone, a news thing came up that there's, they're predicting there's going to be a shortage of tomatoes this year because of climate change and, and weather changes. There's going to be a shortage of tomatoes, which means the number one and number two foods that Americans eat are going to be in jeopardy, French fries and ketchup. There's going to be a ketchup shortage. But how do you prepare when, if, if there's no food on the grocery shelves? Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared for that to happen? If you can't leave your home because there's some kind of civil crisis and you can't leave your home to go buy food, are you prepared for that? Do you have enough water in your home? Are you prepared for water shortages, power outages? It is predicted that this summer we may have several blackout times because it's predicted to be super hot and it will overload the electrical grids and we may have some power outages. Are you even ready for that? There are so many weird crises going on in our world today. Not only COVID, there's monkeypox. The poisonous plants are more poison. Last summer I got poison ivy. The doctor told me because of the heat, poison ivy is more poison ivy than ever before. It's the worst poison ivy we've ever had. There's weird, there's weird things everywhere. There's ovarian flu. There's a tick called the Lone Star Tick. Have you heard of it? The Lone Star Tick, it is now living in Iowa. The Lone Star Tick carries alpha-gal. My friend has alpha-gal. She accused me of genetically engineering, because I, li I work in medical research, she accused me of genetically engineering the Lone Star Tick to turn people into vegetarians. <laughs> the Lone Star Tick, if it bites you and you get alpha-gal, for the rest of your life, you cannot eat meat. If you eat meat, it puts you into like anaphylactic shock and you have to go to the emergency room. She's been to the emergency room several times. Every time she, she tells me, this is all your fault. I said, stop eating meat. You're a vegetarian now. Just be a vegetarian. But is that not a weird thing, that you get bit by an insect and it turns you into a vegetarian? It's the weirdest thing. It's just so weird. We have flying worms. We have mosquitoes in Michigan. The mosquitoes are carrying the EEE -E -E virus. And if a mosquito bites you and you get the EEE -E -E virus, you will die. And so they're telling people in certain parts of western Michigan, don't go outside in the evening if there's a lot of mosquitoes in your area because they're carrying in that area the EEE -E -E virus. It is a weird time to be alive. Are you prepared for weird things to be happening in the medical field? Are you prepared for weird viruses? Do you have extra masks at home? Do you have extra things at home to help you to be prepared for these things? We do have potential for earthquakes in the Midwest. We might think we don't. However, the largest earthquake in history was right in Missouri. When that earthquake happened in Missouri, Guess what happened in Iowa? Houses cracked in northwest Iowa. That's how big the earthquake was in Missouri. They are predicting that that earthquake in Missouri 
is about due for another episode. And we can't just sit here and think we're kind of sheltered and none of this is going to affect us because it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic to think that way. What if Noah had had our attitude? You know, what if Noah had, Noah had had our attitude? We also are in tornado zone, right? When we moved here from Kansas City, I thought, yay, we're not going to be in the tornado zone anymore. I don't think I ever lived in a place that had so much wind. Like, Bob and I have this joke, like, what's the weather today? Windy. Right? Because it seems like it's always windy here. And tornado. We've already had so many tornado threats where we had to go into the basement. It's, we do live in a tornado zone. Is the whole world just becoming a tornado zone at the end of the world? Maybe. I don't know. All these things, Jesus said, he listed all these scenarios like a prepper manual. You should be aware that any of these scenarios could happen in your area. Therefore, you should be prepared for any of these things to happen in your area. And yet, there's more things coming. The worst, like my sister said, the worst is still coming. In the last days, it says the church would be like Laodicea. I am increased with goods. I have need of nothing. I have everything I need. What do I care? Isn't that the attitude of the Laodicean church? I, 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 what a narcissistic attitude. I have everything I need. I don't need anything. Therefore, the world is a happy place. That's not a very Christian attitude when our attitude should be, Jesus said these things are coming and we should be prepared so we are prepared to help other people. If Noah had the attitude that we have, what if Noah said, yeah, the flood is coming in, what, 100 years? The flood is coming, 120 years? So, yeah, 120 years. I'm going to just chill for 120 years. What did Noah do for 120 years? How much food do you think was in the ark to feed all the animals, seven of every kind and two of every kind? To feed all the animals for a year. A lot of food. He, he, it took him 120 years of prepping to be ready for the flood. When the children of Israel came out of the wilderness, God said, all right, you're going into the wilderness. You've been in the city of Egypt for all these years. The night's going to come. Just walk into the wilderness with your skirt on and your dress shoes and your tie. Is that what God said? He said, go to all your Egyptian neighbors, take your backpack, get everything that you can, prepare, put in your backpack, and when the time comes, when the clock strikes, with all of your preparations, you're going to go into the wilderness. And they went into the wilderness fully prepared and equipped with what they needed to live. Did they have faith in God? Yes. Were they equipped? Yes. Also, we just had in our Sabbath school lesson about Joseph. So Joseph was in Egypt. Pharaoh had a dream. He dreamt that there were seven fat cows and then seven skinny cows. And in his dream, the skinny cows ate the fat cows. He's like, I don't know what that means. And then in his dream, he, had se he dreamt seven plump wheat grains and then seven skinny wheat grains. And the skinny wheat grains ate the fat wheat grains. And Pharaoh said, I don't know what that means. So he asked all the wise men of Egypt, tell me what the dream means. They said, I don't know what it means. And so finally Joseph was brought, and Joseph said, there's going to be seven years of preparation for seven years of famine. So they took 20% of all the produce that they had every year for seven years and stored it up for the seven years of famine. What if they just said, Mm, that's not going to happen. 
It's easy to have the mentality when everything is provided that nothing is going to happen. We're the first generation in American history that don't know how to take care of ourselves. We are totally dependent as a people. We are totally dependent on grocery stores. We're totally dependent on Red Cross and organizations to come to our aid. When I first started doing these seminars <clears throat> about 40 years ago, remember I'm 29, so you know. <laughs> when I first started doing these about 40 years ago, the, the, the recommendation from all organizations were that you would have 72 hours or three days of preparation, and they figured that within three days, some firemen, policemen, ADRA, Red Cross, somebody would be able to come and rescue you. Do you know what the recommendation is now? At least 14 days. That it could take as much as 14 days for anyone to come to your aid in a situation. So the recommendation is now that you have 14, at least minimum 14 days to be able to be self-sufficient. And I recommend even more than that. The Bible says, if you cannot walk with the footmen, how are you gonna run with the horses? And it's, there's going to be a time when we're going to have to run with the horses, and we should be prepared for doing that. It's not a time to be a wimpy Christian. It's time to be a strong and hopeful and courageous and prepared Christian. If I took... This is me out in the wilderness... I look kind of happy, don't I? I mean, it is my happy place. I love it. I look kind of happy. I have everything I need in my backpack. I have food. I can get water. I know some wild edible plants. I have shelter. I have sleeping bag. I have warmth. I have comfort. I have things that I need in there. And, you know, I'm thriving in that picture. But if I took somebody, let's say I plucked somebody from downtown Chicago that had absolutely no preparation or experience in the wilderness and put them in that situation, how do you think they would feel? And it's the difference between having some mental and spiritual and physical preparation for what's coming in the world versus being in la-la land, expecting nothing will ever happen, being prepared for nothing, and being overwhelmed with what happens, overwhelmed with fear when, th when things happen. So this is a mental preparation, it's a physical preparation, it's a spiritual preparation. A guy wrote a book called Deep Survival, and he talks about different scenarios, war, famine, imprisonment, civil unrest, sickness, and why do some people survive in that situation, and why do some people die? And it boiled down to basically two things. You can take everything from a person except for their attitude, right? And attitude is a big thing in survival situation. And the other thing is realizing that you have more than you think you have. And I'm gonna talk about that this afternoon. One thing can be a multitude of things, right? I mean, think about it. So Bob has a sport coat on. It is a sport coat, right? I mean, uh, pastors are supposed to wear those to church, I guess, right? So it can keep you warm in the wilderness, but what else, I mean, it could keep you warm in the cold. What else could it be? So a blanket. 
What else? Survivors have this mentality that things are more than they appear to be, right? And we need to learn how to do that so that what you have is adaptable to be more than one thing, where one thing becomes a multitude of things. A handkerchief is not just a handkerchief, right? It's a multitude of, of, of things. It's a water pure of, of filter. It's a, it's a sling. It's a Band-Aid. It's you know, a bunch of stuff. So survivors have this mentality that what you see is not just what you see. And we can learn to, we can learn that perception. If we begin thinking about it, we can learn that and we can get better at it. And none of us are perfect at it, but we can get better and better at it so that we see potential where there's no potential. We see hope where there's no hope, right? We see courage where there's no courage. We see a fire where there's no fire. We see, you know, something where there's nothing. And that's the mentality that God wants us to have. In the world today, there are people who have basically nothing. When Bob and I were in the Philippines, we were in the slums and the ghettos of Manila, and people lived in like boxes, right? And I met some of the most wonderful people I've ever met in my life. And they ate white rice every day. They ate white rice every single day. That's all they had, white rice. And they sang the most beautiful, happy songs. They had the best attitudes. They were so joyful. And we can learn to have an attitude of a survivor where we can find joy where there's little joy. And that's what God is calling us to, this preparation. There were kids in the Philippines that just had white rice. In fact, in the meetings that I did, I was by myself with just the people I met in the Philippines, did meetings out of a Catholic uh, chief police's garage. And I gave extra money so that I could buy food to feed all the people that came to the meeting, like give them something special for dinner besides white rice and white bread with like a mayonnaise thing on it. And the pastor of the church that I was working with stole all my money. Weirdest thing ever. But we had white rice every day. And even in the hotel where Bob and I stayed, we had white rice for breakfast every day. I went over there hating rice I now love rice <laughs> because it reminds me of that survivor's attitude to just be thankful. One day at the hotel, they had something like soy sauce. I'm like, oh, soy sauce, I'm so happy. I put it on my rice. I was so happy to have something salty. Don't you think it's time with all the weirdness in the world that we develop an attitude of joy in the midst of crisis. And I believe that's what God is really calling us to. When you see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you've given us this chapter in Matthew 24 and other verses in the Bible to help us to know the scenarios that are going to play out at the end of the world. Thank you that you give us wisdom and guidance to know that we need to be prepared for these things that are going to happen, not just so that we'll live, Lord, but so that we can help other people to live. Please give us that survivor's attitude. In Jesus' name, amen.